Sure. Yeah. Uh, I was trying to load this up into some cohesive uh, manner. I'm trying to see if this works. Let me see if this works. Uh, give me a second. Uh, here. All right. Move this out of the way. Awesome. Oh, Move out of the way. There we go. Um, well, they're all playing at once. Let's see, how do I? Anyways, uh, I'm to this up. so this is a patient with metastatic cancer. Yeah, this is not going to work well. Uh, just look at the top. Um, first two MRI CINE images, and you can see that there is uh, thickening of the, this is the tricuspid valve. There's a fair amount of tricuspid regurgitation. Uh, additionally, let me go through, um, just load this up real quick, and show the other valves as well. So you can see that the right heart is a little dilated. There's flattening of the septum during diastole. You can also see here this tricuspid valve. Now, I have to tell you, most of the time when you look at the uh, valve leaflets on a short axis image, while the mitral valve is usually pretty discernible with its nice three leaflets, you can see here. So nice. You know, you can see the, the two, I'm sorry, two leaflets, three scallops. Um, so there's three scallops on each leaflet. There's an A1, an A2, and an A3, and a P1, a P2, and a P3. Sometimes they're better seen than others. But in general, the tricuspid valve isn't as well demarcated uh, on MR, especially the short axis. But here we can see that the valve leaflets, not only is there this really pronounced regurgitation, but the valve leaflets of the tricuspid valve, um, at least the two that we see here, are pretty thickened and irregular. And then additionally, um, if we scroll more towards the base of the heart, we can see that there is this tri-leaflet uh, pulmonic valve, but we can see that it doesn't have a normal opening by any means. Uh, it's not, we just happen to get, get a great cross-section of it here. Normally, it's not this nice on um, just a short axis image, but you can see that the valve leaf is thickened and there's a very reduced opening area. And I said previously that this patient has a history of malignancy, and if you look, you may be able to denote some uh, or see some areas of some masses within the uh, liver. And let me see if I can find another, just a good image. Uh, anyways, um, just, just a short axis image. Pull this up. And here you can better see all the different masses in the liver. Uh, even on this, is just an axial localizer. You can see the uh, thickening of the pulmonic valve, thickening of the tricuspid valve. And then just to show it nicely on the CT, and then I'll dump the case. But this is someone with metastatic uh, carcinoid. Um, and you can see here the thickening of the tricuspid valve, and then also more pronounced, the thickening and irregularity here of the pulmonic valve. I always tell people that you should rarely ever see the pulmonic valve on uh, normal CT studies. It should, if you do see it, it should be very uh, wispy and diminutive. Um, here, I mean, it's, it's anything but. It's quite thick and irregular. Uh, you can see it's not a great angle I'm giving you, but there's three leaflets of the pulmonic valve, the anterior, the left, and the right. Um, anyway, so here it is. How thick so this is someone with carcinoid heart, uh, which is secondary to, uh, you know, it's secondary to serotonin derivatives that uh, do not get um, uh, broken down by the liver uh, due to um, the malignancy, and they form this fibrous thickening of the uh, of the uh, endocardial surfaces, uh, most notably the uh, endocardial surfaces on the valve. So this can involve actually any endocardial surface, but really it becomes most pronounced in the valve. And so it's just a nice example of carcinoid heart that we just, I don't know, something we don't see very often. 
even though we see a lot of carcinoid, uh, with metastatic carcinoid, we don't see a lot of that. Um, what was the primary, Seth? It was, a, it was one of these, like, uh, carcinoids in the bowel. Okay. Um, it, anything more, you want something more specific than that, I can look it up, but it's, uh, it was a um, metastatic carcinoid uh, neuroendocrine tumor from, that was a small bowel primary. You know, one of these kind of lesions that has that, I think, classic kind of speculated thing in the mesentery with the adjacent bowel lesion. Thank you. Uh, in this case, oh, this isn't, so this is just an interesting case that I had not seen this before. Um, so this is a young guy who came in and uh, he was flown here. He was a military diver from... Uh, that was stationed in Guam, and he was on a recreational drive uh, dive with a buddy, and um, became very. The story's not entirely clear if he became disoriented uh, during the dive or after the dive. But what is known is that he, he surfaced way too quickly, um, and uh, came to the surface was was babbling, incoherent condition deteriorated quite dramatically. Uh, and then we have one of the few hyperbaric oxygen chambers, uh, and we were the closest, not the closest hospital with the hyperbaric so they, uh, chambers, so they flew him from uh, Guam to here and to UCSD. And uh, you can see that he's got extensive pneumomedes dynamics consolidation. And the CT findings are interesting. And the question is, um, you know, what are the actual CT findings. We can see that he's got uh, pronounced uh, not only uh, pneumomediastinum, but areas of pulmonary interstitial emphysema as well. And uh, he had uh, extensive neurologic deficits on MRI, uh, which in all presumed due to uh, air embolism from this, um, uh, from this, what, if you want to call it, Kaysan's disease or whatever you want to call it. And, and then here we see in the parenchyma this very nice, gorgeous kind of crazy paving pattern with more dependent consolidation and superimposed ground glass. And the question is to the group, you know, pathologically, what do you think this represents? I mean, we know that the patient had uh, presumably the dependent stuff is going to be aspiration because it, it was presumed to be he had a massive aspiration event at the time. But the other material that is... Uh, what we're seeing here. Do you think this is pulmonary hemorrhage? Do you think it's sequela of microscopic air embolism? Um, do you think it's, you know, acute lung injury of some other form, like in a diffuse alveolar damage? I can tell you that uh, three weeks later, I should have in included it. He was extubated. His chest x-ray was fine. And his mental deficits were improving. Um, so what do you think this material represents, or has anyone ever have seen any other case of the bends or severe um, barrow trauma in terms of a diving incident with extensive, supposedly extensive path proven air embolization? Um, and I'll leave it open to you guys because I, I, I just didn't know really what to call this. So, Seth, would you think maybe it is just one injury similar to a fat embolism syndrome? Or just getting I would think, I would think it's similar. An endothelial injury that then leads to progressive cascade in the lung. I mean, that's what I was going with. And I was going with, you know, that I think that more dependent stuff was aspirated. Supposedly when he came before he was transferred and before his lungs really started to go crazy, he was documented to have a massive aspiration when they were transferring him. So that, I think that explains the lower lungs, but um, I was just assuming this was all sequela of air, air embolism with, with small vessel injury in areas of hemorrhage. Um, but I, I just had never seen a case before. But I've seen fat embolism look similar. Mm -hmm. um, Seth, Seth, was this CT on the way to or after, after the hyperbaric chamber? This was like day one or two. This might have been day one before he really got treated. So uh, pre-hyperbaric. It was before hyperbaric, or if he was in the hyperbaric chamber. I mean, you don't come out of the hyperbaric chamber, so this was early on in the disease. So I'm imagining it was really before the hyperbaric chamber. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I would just call this consistent with acute lung injury. 
I think the anterior posterior gradient of opacity can also be explained by that alone. I mean, of course, yes. you could aspirate it, but the opacity in the dependent lungs is, if one image patients with acute lung injury, ARDS, one would see that pattern very commonly, and it's ascribed to just the weight of the lung and atelectasis in dependent lung. If you put the patient prone and you ventilate them prone and did a CT, a lot of times that posterior lung would aerate quite nicely. So that may be a manifestation of of that phenomenon that occurs in patients with yeah. I just didn't because, right. I, I, I wasn't didn't know if fat embolism itself actually or air embolism actually caused DAD or if it caused I mean if it caused just a presumed areas of uh, vascular occlusion subsequent hemorrhage. Um, I, I just don't know pathologically if anyone if Yeah, I'm not sure exactly what's going on in the lung. It was just, I just never seen a, a case. So I thought that was interesting. And yeah, then the last case, which is, um, I will show, is an older case from a couple of months ago that I don't, I don't think I ever showed here. But this is a, a young woman from uh, Central America that emigrated here that had uh, dilated cardiomyopathy and had positive um, markers for uh, for uh, I can never pronounce it. Uh, tri oh, I'm not even try for for Chagas disease or the bug. And I could pronounce the cruzi trypanosomus cruzi T cruzi. I can never pronounce it well. Um, and was uh, you know known to have um, Chagas cardiomyopathy. And um, this is just her. We had a follow up. She had her. She had an outside MRI which looked very similar, and uh, we have a dilated cardiomyopathy. But this is clearly a non-ischemic pattern. And you know, most people, it just looks like a. a most people, I would call this either myocarditis or sarcoid, some form of, of myocardial injury, presumably. Uh, but this was due to Chagas, and there are two forms of Chagas that are, you know, the uh, the classic one or the one that's actually less common is the one where you get these pronounced apical aneurysms, um, which this patient doesn't have. And the other one is more of a, just a myocarditis like picture, which is what her um, manifestation was. And, you know, it's hard to always, she didn't have a biopsy of her, of her heart showing that she to confirm hundred percent that this was truly a Chagas related uh, myocarditis. But um, that's her diagnosis. She was diagnosed a long time ago, and all the um, all of her antibodies were positive, and they're presuming that it was. But she could have had a theoretically a case of myocarditis from something else, and also had a Chagas disease. But just kind of making one disease out of it. So, anyways, oh, at, at this stage, at this stage, Seth, is this just um, cardio? or is this active inflammation do you think no it's it's all she's been treated it's all just now we're in the this is all myocardial fibrosis so this will um, not ever get better uh, it won't ever recover uh, and we can see the myocardial fibrosis is involving the sub epicardial mid myocardial portions even some areas pretend, you know some sub endocardial areas um, you know there's not a ton of involvement of the RV sarcoid. We tend to see a little more RV involvement with sarcoid. Something that may be able to differentiate, but at this point in time, it's just extensive scarring um, from her injury. And and uh, oftentimes these people just their LV function will continue to deteriorate uh, and have to go to transplant. But um, she's you know, young; she's in her twenty. They also get esophageal dilation. Yes. Does she have that too? I don't, you know, it's funny. I think I looked at I am. I think I even looked at her uh, esophagram when I was pulling this up because she had one. Um, she did not. But let me go to see okay. if I can find that just an axial localizer real quick. Right now, look, that's uh, not eh, a little fluid in there. But let me see if I can find a better one. But I, I don't think she had uh, the esophageal dysmotility issues that is classically associated with the disease as well. Now esophagus looks pretty good here. But I, I have to go back and see if there's any uh, physiologic abnormality, but anatomically it doesn't look bad. And if I remember correctly, it wasn't. Are those rejuvenated bugs in the U.S. now? 
It's it's getting warm. And those are uh, those are my. Favorite. All right. Thanks, Seth. Uh, all right, David or Howard. I can go anytime you like. All righty. Okay. Uh, this is a case that of a thing that I have never heard of before. Mm -hmm. best, and I'll show it to you. So, here is a image from a patient in whom there is abnormal opacity uh, in relation to the right infrahyla region and some ill-defined opacity um, beyond it. Here is the lateral projection. So there is abnormality here in the right middle lobe. So we have a combination of a infrahyla abnormality and right middle lobe abnormality. Let me show you the CT. This is from 2015. And here we go. So we'll see when we get down to bronchus intermedius, we see endoluminal abnormality. And then pretty quickly, we're going to lose the lumen entirely, or nearly entirely. You'll see that there is no air really in the middle lobe bronchus. So the process involves right middle lobe. And there is an adelectatic right middle lobe. And the right lower loop looks okay. So we have a lesion there. And I must say, I don't really know what that is for the moment. So just ignore that for the moment. And we'll focus on that. So endoluminal abnormality in this person. Bronchoscopy. Let's bring that up here. I hope this doesn't crash. So let's go back one here. You can see the history there. And you can also see the lesion described in bronchus intermedius. And they took some of that out, but there's still some abnormality occluded with tumor. So nice correspondence between the bronchoscopy results and the imaging that I showed you for that. Here is the pathology, which is really interesting. So I'll just give you a look at that, spindle cells. They did some vascular markers and other kinds of markers to try and define what this tumor is and pretty much all negative as you can see there. And they're doing a bunch of stuff until they do this romamine or amine stain and identify lots of organisms consistent with mycobacterium in there. And this person is one person in a case report which I'll show you just recently published one of three and they called this entity, which I've never heard before, so I'll mag it up so that you can get that reference too. But it's a mycobacterial spindle cell pseudotumor. Two of the patients were HIV positive. Hey, it's Leif's name on the Broad page. differential diagnosis. Our fellow years ago. But some kind of acid fast that should be mycobacterial lesion, which I've never heard of before. The bronchial. I know the patients with HIV, I think, can get some kind of spindle cell or myogenic lesion that can cause a nodule, but I've never heard of this before. But there you are. They call it a pulmonary mycobacterial spindle cell pseudotumor. Add that to the list. Well, like, like a gumma, you know, it's a syphilitic tumor, a gumma. Something like that. So, yeah, when I saw that, I said, oh, okay. it was one of the patients from here, so I could take a look at it, and one of them was from here, so I showed it to you. So, I don't know, just put that in your uh, in your library of odd things. <laughs> <laughs> yes, for sure. Okay, here is a, a really informative case. So, I'm sure you've all been in a situation where someone has said, oh, they've ordered a PE, but um, can you... Can you also evaluate a patient for interstitial lung disease at the same time? And the answer is something like a qualified yes. Of course, if you uh, have a patient with extensive abnormalities of interstitial fibrosis, like articulation, honeycomb, traction, bronchiectasis, yeah, of course we can see that. But broadly conceived, as you'll see here, it's not a good idea otherwise to try and define mm -hmm. interstitial lung disease. So this is a patient with no PE, this is the CTPA, 
And I'll just scroll around and give you a feel for what the lungs look like. So there's definitely too much opacity in the apical lungs and the upper lobes, but that seems to kind of disappear. And then when we get lower down, knowing that this is not in full inspiration, that capillaries contain some contrast medium, and we have these basal lung opacities consistent with dependent lung atelectasis, what else can one really say about a patient like this? So I then noticed that they actually repeated the exam just some hours later on the same day. So I'll bring that up. So this is at 9.16 p.m. The previous one was at about 5 p.m. And this is why I'm going to scroll from the bottom up in this patient. So here we go. And ordinary window width and window level. I think I'll make this big. You can already see that we have what I call diffuse hypoattenuated lung and a black bronca sign in that the lungs are too opaque. And if you look closely, you can intuit that you may have confluent central lobular nodules that produces this gray lung. And then, of course, as the extent of cellular infiltration increases, then we form larger, ill defined, confluent GGOs. Until in the upper lobes, we have this that we saw in the CTPA. But now we have a much better feel for the extent of abnormality. There are a couple of lobules here and there that are unaffected. But I think in the differential diagnosis, we've shown cases like this many times before. This is super suggestive of hypersensitivity pneumonitis. Here is the result of a bronchoalveolar lavage and transbronchial biopsy. 80% lymphocytes goes along with that pretty nicely. They did see some lots of lymphocytes, alveolitis, and a couple of non-necrotizing interstitial granulomas. So I think this is super typical of hypersensitivity pneumonitis. It's a kind of an instructive case from that point of view. Can't really do this kind of thing and uh, see it on a CTPA and really see all the important findings. Gray lungs. Howard, did, were there any exposures considering that looks like the active form of HP? They queried him and could not find any, mm -hmm. which I think is quite common, right? Yeah. And then they just, they just start them on steroids and see how those how they do. But no, no, no identifiable or obvious antigen responsible. You, you for wonder it. if the the opacities and the apices are uh, little areas of organizing ammonia may be sort of an acute on active, you know, kind of a chronic -y appearance. You know, the because that's more extensive. Yeah, it looks like yeah, right there. So maybe an acute flare that causes it to present. Because I, I, I can't imagine he was asymptomatic before this, given that. Situation. Yeah, you would wonder. Yeah. So maybe just a big exposure to the antigen or a, an acute hyperexposure that you inhale mm. and get more, more opacity. Really? What I'm not showing you is a follow-up exam in which this improved a lot, but the rest of it, the background still remained. It was still abnormal. So he improved, but not not entirely, on a on a short term follow up. Yeah, but just without. So he's still a bit of a, an enigma. Right, thanks. But I presume you guys would be very comfortable. I certainly was in calling this hypersensitivity pneumonitis, so very consistent with that. Absolutely. Yeah. Great. Uh, let me show you this one. This is a really unfortunate kind of case where when you interpret the radiographs, you know it's going to be something really bad. So here is the frontal projection of the chest. We have this large opacity. It is the Harlem overlay sign. So we still see the right pulmonary artery. And if you look, you can perceive that there is substantial rib abnormality. Yes, on the lateral projection, it is posterior. So it's a large mass in that location. And then I'll show you the oh, it's got me. horrible lesion that it is. Unfortunately, you can see tremendous rib destruction, vertebral body sorry, and posterior elements destruction. Wow. A lesion that has calcified and or ossified matrix, certainly consistent with costal cartilage matrix in a very aggressive lesion like that. And this turns out to be this particular form of 
chondrosarcoma called a mesenchymal chondrosarcoma. So just a, an excerpt of something I found about mesenchymal chondrosarcoma. We've certainly seen chondrosarcomas and, and other chondroid lesions in the chest, but this particular variant I don't think I've seen before, but it's, it's pretty bad as you can see. All right, Jeff, those are my cases. All right, David. I've got a couple. All right. Don't post op complications today. <laughs> so can people see the radiograph of this, I uh, think, 28-year-old man who had some left chest pain and some dyspnea? Yes, we can. You're going to okay. tell us you were scuba diving before this. Huh. No. No. Um, I'll give you a clue. I mean, it's abnormal, and he has uh, he has a pneumothorax. Actually, he has a hemo pneumothorax or a hydro pneumothorax with the fluid level down there, and then he's got this big um, hole in the lung here, a big bulla or something like that. I think we're seeing the bottom wall of that bulla here. Um, he got a CT scan around that time at the uh, at the outside hospital, and this is some weird uh, image. Let me show you this. This will be better. Um, so at this point, it's got a drain in place and, um, it looks as if there might be a few loculations in this big air collection. And then I think the interesting thing is which, which part of the lung is it coming from? It actually looks as if the residual lung, which is collapsed here is, is anterior. And this is actually the upper lobe. So I was first thinking in a 28 year old man that this was going to be a giant giant bolus emphysema, but then I recognize on the CT scan, it's actually this big bull or whatever it is, is actually in the lower lobe. Mm -hmm. um, and eventually this thing was, this thing was resected. And um, <clears throat> the surgeon described it as, uh, he thought it was a big bulla in the lower lobe, but he did say it was lower lobe. That was nice confirmation of what I thought of from the CT scan. And the pathologist identified ciliary epithelium, ciliated epithelium, uh, covering parts of it, not all of it, but parts of it. And that made them think that this was actually a CPAM because of the ciliated thing. So this wasn't the lining that they would expect if this were just a giant bulla. So this is probably a CPAM in the lower lobe. It was, um, it was resected and, um, his, this is his recovery. This is um, about a week after the surgery. You can see he's had rib resection here. He's got quite a bit of pleural effusion left here. And I think this is effusion um, tucking into fissure, but the lung re-expanded pretty nicely. So, you know, I think this probably is a CPAM. That lower lobe um, origin would be fine for a CPAM. I, I have to review the numbering system, but this is a very large lesion with maybe a few a few locules of, uh, of the cyst. So these are large. So it's going to be a type something or other. But I think that the lung, it probably was not huge because it allowed the lung to grow pretty normally. I think that um, when the lung re-expands here, it looks like pretty close to normal lung. I don't think that this is fairly hypoplastic lung that would have resulted if he had a large lesion at the time that he was growing as a child. So I think maybe it was smaller and enlarged then and then ruptured and caused the pneumothorax. But I'll, uh, you know, this lung seems to have developed fairly normally. So we'll, I'll wait and see what things look like in terms of lung volume once that, you know, once he's recovered more fully from the surgery and has the pleural effusion gone and maybe gets his diaphragm down a little bit more. But so far it's, uh, we're con calling this CPAM. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and then uh, here's a woman who had uh, heart failure. She's got a lot of, uh, she's got a defibrillator in place at this point. And eventually she acquired a Swan-Gans catheter. And now a catheter's in place going to the right hilum. In the old days, people used to park these catheter tips out here, clearly in the lung, in the hilum. And um, so these days, they seem to park the tips back in the mediastinum most of the time, at least here at the University of Washington, what's what's the experience of other people in that regard? Do Swangans catheters typically extend into lung or are they kept in the mediastinum at your places? What do you think? 
usually more central, David. So I guess that's hypersensitivity to the idea of uh, of having you know Madness. having infarctions when the balloon is blown up and things like that. Maybe that's what's going on. So at any rate, at this point we have a catheter, and this is as far as it gets. So right hilum. In the old days, this would have been considered um, perfectly normal placement. Um, then a while later, you can see that a, a lesion has now emerged here in the right lung. So this is several days after that. At this point, an impella has been placed as well for her severe heart failure. Now we never saw the catheter tip get out to this location, but uh, this person has a, a persisting lesion that shows up very nicely here is a pulmonary artery pseudoaneurysm. So presumably this is catheter <laughs> induced, this lesion here yeah. from that swan gans catheter. But we never saw the catheter get this far peripheral, but um, it might have transiently or they might have had some difficulty in the placement or something like that. But we have this round lesion which fills nicely with contrast and um, here it is, this pulmonary artery pseudoaneurysm here in this view. So let, let me connect this up with a pulmonary artery for you. You can see it, pulmonary artery balloons like that and then tapers off into normal caliber. And this has persisted now. So this thing emerged uh, back in June and this is the current imaging. This is now October, just a few days ago and we still have this very discreet round lesion down here. So persisting pseudoaneurysm. I don't know whether they will elect to coil this thing or stent it or do something like that. It seems to me that it's very dilated and it seems to me there's a risk of rupture of this thing. So it seems to me they would want to do something about this. Yeah. David, can, when you finish, can I just mention something else that is kind of interesting but not related to that directly? Okay. Um, ready is this okay arch. now? Uh, the patient had a heart transplant, right? Yeah, should have. Yeah. Can you zoom up into the, because uh, the patient had heart failure and then stenotomy, but now the heart looks fine, right? Yes. Okay, oh, can you zoom into the uh, left pectoral region just below the left clavicle? Yeah, yeah the tie down. And zoom up there. Um, okay. And if you can, bring it to the middle so we can see those two plastic things, it looks like little plastic things. Right. So there, I think these are the um, the cuff, uh, the cuff anchors or the introducer yeah. things. Those they... are the, um, these, those are the suture sleeves. So oh, yeah. when they, when they took away and put the new heart in and took the pacemaker out, sometimes things get left behind. Sometimes we see fragments of, of leads that were broken during extraction remain. And sometimes we see suture sleeves remain. So if on the, at the time they were, the pacemaker was there and you see the suture sleeves that would go along with that, that's just an aside, a side right. comment. Sometimes people ask about that and say, what are those things? I think, I think the other thing, Howard, is that these things are actually scarred into, into the tissue and it's hard to remove them. So yeah. Yeah. I think I've seen them left behind all the time because I, they pull the lead out through them, but mm -hmm. the itself is really so anchored in tissue, it would be a, you know, you'd that have to do more sharp, dissection to get rid of it. Yep, they just leave them there. Not a big deal. I think that's one of the best clues that the patient has had a heart transplant because they sometimes forget to mention that in the order. And you know, it's right. very rare to extract a defibrillator and not replace it. So anytime I yep. see internal wires and, and we call yeah. eye downs, but the cuffs or the suture sleeves, um, that's the first thing I would question is if they had a heart transplant. And I'd say yeah. you know, ninety five percent of the time it's true, if not more. Yeah, yep. it's true. It is a heart transplant, so generally things look a lot simpler after a transplant because a whole lot of hardware disappears. LVADs disappear, defibrillators disappear, you know, all these patch electrodes. Th things suddenly look just blissfully empty and, and simple. And it's because yep. you know, they threw away the old heart and all the gear that was yep. attached. Yeah. Yep. So that is interesting that they left that pseudoaneurysm there, huh? Okay. Maybe they'll go after it at this point now that everything's stabilized after the... Right. Okay. okay, those are the cases. I'll take care. <laughs> All right. Let's see. Well, I only saw the screen jump one time briefly, so I think we're having a good day. All right. So, well, was it jumping for me? I wasn't jumping. One time it did, and that was it. Okay.
All right, so speaking of pseudoaneurysms, uh, I have a good case of one. So this is a patient with known metastatic renal cell carcinoma and uh, came in uh, a while ago, and this was their initial CT. You can see there's this cavitary mass, complex mass in the right lung. Uh, has metastases elsewhere, but this looks, um, in this case, this looks like an infected or necrotic lesion. And then about uh, a few days later, the patient presented with hemoptysis, a pretty extensive hemoptysis. And you can see there's the necrotic area. The whole right upper lobe is consolidated. And then you've got this round enhancing blob coming off this pulmonary artery in the right upper lobe. So, um, and then uh, PE as well on top of that. So I always wonder if the PE sort of increase the pressure from the acute vasodilation and cause, you know, whatever process was going on here to, to sort of um, accelerate and it led to this pseudoaneurysm. Because um, going back on the non-con CT, I don't think you can see it, even though this is low attenuation uh, necrotic lung. And you can see the right lung is not very happy. It's poorly perfused. Uh, the airways are full of debris. And um, unfortunately, this patient died shortly thereafter, um, presumably from just massive pulmonary hemorrhage. So I don't know, we don't know if this thing ruptured. Um, and the question is, was there, and was it, was this a, a metastasis that eroded? Uh, they did take the patient to angio and they were on the arterial side, the systemic arterial side, looking for a bronchial artery bleed. They saw a small little area, but nothing to get very excited about. Um, and you can see they did a left main intubation to protect the one good lung in this case. But this is a big pseudoaneurysm. I've only seen a few of these, but this is the, and I don't, I don't know exactly what, this ends up being, but I suspect this was a necrotizing infection, uh, less likely a necrotic um, metastasis, because renal cell metastases usually are quite hypervascular, and this looks just very devitalized. Mm. So, yeah. So, yeah. You, there were symptoms of infection. Was this was this presumed to be an? an it's unclear because the patient was pretty ill, and this happened rather over you know less than a twenty four hour period. Had widespread metastases, so it's unclear. But there, as far as I know, there was no frank pus or anything coming out of the endotracheal tube, but it went, it went downhill pretty quickly. Okay, so I've got a collection of surgical things that have crept in. So this is a fascinating case. So this is a patient, and I've got to get these in order. So had a double lung transplant and was having some problems post-op, so ended up with a tracheostomy, but you can see uh, there was some abnormality in this left lung allograft. It was unclear if it was some atelectasis and some residual um, residual uh, reperfusion injury. So this was uh, the first day, and now we jump ahead the next day, and you can see it's getting a little worse in the left lower lobe. There's still a bunch of support devices in. Patient's getting hemodialysis, uh, ventilator support, feeding tube, et cetera. So a little bit worse in the base. Again, unclear exactly what's happening. Now we jump ahead uh, to the next morning. And now this left allograft is starting to get diffusely abnormal. You know, it looks like it's very either edematous or there's some rejection or something going on. But notice the right lung allograft looks quite good. And the oxygenation was not, was required more and more oxygenation support. Uh, on the ventilator. So, uh, and then we jump ahead later the same day and you can see it gets a lot worse. So at this point, something's wrong. Uh, they did a CT angio looking for PE and any other possible complications. And you can see the left lung is not enhancing very well. It's very boggy, sort of like the last case I showed you. Uh, but there's good arterial flow to it. There's the anastomosis. There's a little bit of a turn in the, in the anastomosis, but you can see there's not a kink. It's getting good arterial perfusion, at least proximally. But as we come down, you'll notice there's a filling defect going into the left atrium, and the inferior pulmonary vein and the superior pulmonary vein are not filling with contrast at all. So, and if you look on the lung windows, we just see there's just lots of white stuff everywhere. A little bit of unusual sparing of the anterior left upper lobe, but this boggy appearance and the absence of venous perfusion, what well, looks like a big thrombus here, was uh, interpreted correctly as, as a venous thrombosis. And so they emergently took the patient to the OR and sure enough, this lung was all swollen and uh, you know just looked like venous congestion, not very happy looking and there was a big thrombus here. So they ended up having to do a pneumonectomy of the allograft. 
for a venous thrombosis. Now I've not so seen a venous complication before right in a transplant, yeah. but you know, presumably That's there's some reason for it. And I don't know if it was a mechanical issue or size match issue or just some slow flow that led to the stasis and then a, just a massive venous infarct. Mm. Yeah. Very so, you know, these progressing opacities and these, you know, typically the pre reperfusion edema we see within 24 hours and it can linger, but it, 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 it rarely gets worse after about two days, after 48 hours, it should start to clear, even if it's slowly. And this patient had been, was, been a, out of, uh, was post transplant more than a week at this time, and then this new opacity developing. Then you have to start thinking about rejection infection. It was so unilateral that then you also have to consider sort of a subacute mechanical complication. So why it took this long, I don't know. So that's why I wondered if there was sort of slow flow that eventually clot formed and eventually it got big enough that it led to the thrombosis. The, the acute decline in thrombosis. Okay. Um, now this is another transplant case, and I think I may have shown a similar but much milder case of this years ago. But this patient is, um, I think I remember not that far out, but was an outpatient at this point from a right lung transplant for fibrosis. And you can see the, uh, I should show the radiograph first. Uh, we have a decently looking allograph. You can see the, the, the chest wall defect, but there's this funny fluid level on the right and maybe a second one here. If you look at it, it's very elongated, which would favor, um, and it looks like we're seeing it anteriorly here, which would favor a, a, a pleural abnormality, maybe like a loculated hydroneumothorax, but it does have a very odd orientation. Uh, so the patient had a CT scan uh, later that day, and we can see the airway, nastim oops, airway nastimosis looks good. Uh, and then we see the, the, the defect in the chest wall, which is very common. The ribs are spread. There's intact fascia. But then as you get to the middle lobe, you realize there's this cystic or cavitary space with this dense and ends up being fairly high attenuation debris in there. And it's right along the thoracotomy margin. You'll see these rib ends right there. And there's some ground glass around it. And the patient did have some mild hemoptysis. And then if we look at the, let's find, it right. there we go, the bone window, you'll notice at the thoracotomy, and there's the blood, at the thoracotomy defect, there's a little step off in the rib. Uh, so there's some sharp edges here, for lack of a better word. So our, our working diagnosis is this is a mechanical phenomenon and not a pneumothorax, because you see this claw or tongue of lung reach around back underneath it here, making me think this is mm. intraparenchymal. And I, I had a case years ago where these little little tiny little cavitary nodules near a thoracotomy defect. They occurred much later. And so presumably this is a friction anomaly uh, or abnormality that led to this. Now, subsequently, the patient's gone, gotten better, no more hemoptysis. So the blood probably scarred, causes to help scar down over time. And this thing is just going to go away on its own. I talked to the surgeon. He's not going to do anything. The patient's doing fine. But I would call this a mechanical um, injury to the lung probably just from repetitive motion. And, you know, the thoracotomy defects are usually clean, but this one had a little bit of fragment there, so it presumably punctured the lung. Oh, very interesting. Yeah. All right, here's another complicated uh, patient. Uh, this patient uh, has a history of breast cancer, and here's and it presented with some airway obstruction and was noted to have these two filling defects in the right main bronchus and this occluding one in the left main bronchus. And uh, earlier bronchoscopy attempts to biopsy this showed no tumor, just some funny lymphocytes. And uh, so the patient was seen here, a nice smoke artifact, by the way, in the left atrium, Travis would like that. You see there's a lot of secretions in the left lower lobe. Wow. Um, even some air trapping on the side, you can see the asymmetry and lung attenuation. So the patient uh, uh, was brought, came here, and one of our interventional pulmonologists uh, did a bronchoscopy, and they tried to open up the airway a little bit, and they did. This right one looked better. Um, but shortly thereafter, uh, the bronchoscopy, the patient then developed um, a pneumothorax with these fluid levels. So clearly, uh, there was a complication afterwards. And, you know, they did a, a – airway was – in the bronch report, the airway was – the posterior wall in particular was pretty – lots of this inflammatory tissue or whatever it was, wasn't a nice, healthy airway. So at this point, 
things aren't looking great. They put a drain in and still have a persistent leak. There's a pneumothorax. So uh, this was a CT. Here's the CT that was done uh, just about an hour after that last radiograph. And they were looking for all sorts of complications. And we can see that they did a pretty good job opening up this right upper lobe bronchus, that soft tissue's gone. Um, but what, what we did notice here is that there's this funny collection. We follow the trachea down. There's the posterior wall of the left bronchus, but then you have this collection that tracks down medially um, around in here that's got fluid in it and gas that seems to be outside the mediastinum, but rather in the pleural space. And then there's this airway that goes right into it. So it was unclear exactly what was going on, if the left upper lobe was still obstructed or not, but we came to the conclusion eventually that there was a disruption of the wall of the bronchus and it created a bronchopleural fistula that's located immediately. The left lung is still collapsed. And then there's this collection here. Um, and so, yeah, unfortunately, this patient wasn't doing well either. And um, I think just selected for supportive measures because there wasn't a lot to really patch here. I was gonna have this fistula probably some spillage of debris. But what also is fascinating is the pathology on this. Uh, I think initially people are gonna think that these were breast cancer metastases, but it turns out it's a lymphoma. Oh my word. Secondary lymphoma involving the airway leading to this obstruction. But this is a, you know, just one of the, one of the complications of debriding the airway is if there's no viable airway wall left is that it can, even with gentle debridement, sometimes the airway falls apart. Um, you know, I was worried that the, the whole bronchus had separated because I couldn't follow the bronchus. But I think what helped ultimately towards the end was the fact you could make out the cartilage of the bronchus. So the bronchus was still there. It was just filled with secretions. Otherwise, I would have had a hard time finding the airway uh, because this pneumothorax would not would not go away. And there was a big air leak. And that's because you have this fistula here. So another surgical complication or procedural one. Um, I showed you that one. I showed you that one. Uh, this is just a fun case and actually rather challenging radiograph. At least uh, we thought it was. So this is a kidney transplant patient. And let me find the old, oh, there we go. Let's put them up side by side. So this is um, an old radiograph from July. Uh, patient was normal at this point. Patient comes in with fever and shortness of breath at this point. And you look at the radiograph, and on first glance, you don't really see much of anything. And you know, yeah, on closer inspection, you can see maybe there's a difference between the two, but you know, different different institutions, different units. It's always mm -hmm. a real challenge. Yeah. Uh, here's the CT scan, and I'll put up the old, the new radiograph next to it. And you can see there's just diffuse, tiny nodules everywhere. So miliary pattern, patient was sick, but not that sick. So miliary TB, while possibility, they're usually a lot sicker in my experience. Uh, I had that dominant nodule for me. This is the outside scan, but um, you know, the other thing we would think about around here is miliary histoplasmosis. Um, you know, we can see blasto, but they were usually quite ill. And this patient not only had a, uh, a urinary antigen that was off the charts, but also had histo in the bone marrow and in the bloodstream. So a disseminated histo and is doing well now on IV drugs uh, for this. I'll show you the MIPS as well, assuming it wants to load. Okay, maybe it doesn't. No, it yep. yeah. Is the urinary antigen they look at? Where, where, what was the antigen? Yeah, for histo. There's a blood antibody and there, there's a serum antibody and a urinary antigen. I mean, sorry, yeah, a urinary, I'm sorry, a urinary antigen and a serum antibody. That's but so I think the, the point in this case, and we discussed this amongst ourselves, is when you have really tiny nodules. So David, this would be like the, the P opacities, you know, probably a triple three, a double three on a B read on the ILL classification. They're really hard to see. Right. And, you know, and, and having the old one, if you put them up side by side, you could argue the margins of the vessels are just a little fuzzier, okay. but boy, I'm hard pressed to, to, to I, I think on any day, you'd walk right over this pretty quickly. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so we always struggle with the miliary nodules. They're tough. But this is miliary histoplasmosis in a kidney transplant recipient. All right, and then this is the last surgical mess here. Um, and so this is a patient. I thought I saved the abdominal images, but I did. So this is a 70-year-old who's about a week out from an esophagectomy 
for a, a esophageal carcinoma and was having some abdominal distension. And I thought I saved the abdominal radiographs, but the scanogram tells the story. There's a dilated bowel and there's portal venous gas. So concern for ischemia. The patient had some cardiac issues, so was unsure if they had thrown a clot and this was bowel issues. Uh, so they did a CT of the abdomen and pelvis and a chest CT simultaneously. We'll start with the abdomen and pelvis. You've got this really nice portal venous gas and wonderful example of pneumatosis down here and even in the colon. Uh, so it looks all the world like unhappy, angry bowel. And kudos to my resident who did not fall victim to satisfaction of search in the middle of the night and also was evaluating the chest. And you can see this is an indecided anastomosis. There's the drain right about here. And notice there was also pneumatosis in the uh, conduit. So this is stomach. And also the resident observed the fact there was gas tracking laterally in the mediastinum where it ought not to be. And we're about a week out. And this is not just bubbles of mediastinum. This is a, a, a space filling with gas. And right about in this area, you know, is a staple line, right? So they, they take the stomach and they sort of staple it to make it more tubular. And so there's usually a vertical staple line running around. And we're not too far from the anastomosis either, where they also staple. And you'll see those two staples come together right about there. And then there's a little tract of gas going out. So uh, the resident identified this as a probable dehiscence of the staple line with a leak, which I 100% agree with. There's also pneumatosis. And then continuing not to fall prey to sort of satisfaction of search, there's another collection anteriorly here, which I suspect is a leak uh, as well. Interestingly, so the patient was in the operating room this morning and they did a, a laparotomy and the bowel was all distended, but very healthy looking. So this was a benign pneumatosis in portal venous gas. They decompressed the bowel. Everything was pink and happy. But uh, while they were there, they were able to confirm, they put a scope down, confirm the conduit disruptions, and were able to put a stent across it at the same time, rather than having to bring the patient back for another operation. So, uh, you know, these esophagectomies are always challenging. You talk to your surgeons, and there's really no way to predict who's going to do well um, with them. It's always very tenuous in there. But this is a definitely a leak, um, no abscess yet. So managing conservatively with a stent and they'll presume antibiotics. And then just a strange case of what ends up being benign pneumatosis and portal venous gas. I was trying to tie it together the esophagus and I have a hard time making the two go together. I don't know. I think the pneumatosis may be related, but I don't know if the, uh, it, I can explain all this abnormality in the abdomen just from the chest. No, that is peculiar. Hmm. So, lo lots of weird things came through in the last week or so. So, all right. Well, I will send those along. And it looks like our go-to meeting is meeting now. So that's all good. So I will talk to you all next week. Thank you. Great. Thanks, everyone.